Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Keenan, and I will be your host tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us at our second webinar in the IELTS From Start to Finish series. Uh, today, we're with John Oliver, uh, Don Oliver, one of our resident presenters, and someone who I think everyone should know by now as one of the world's uh, most renowned IELTS experts. Uh, he's here today to walk you through an IELTS writing masterclass and also explain how writing is marked according to the assessment criteria. Uh, he will then be answering questions on the IELTS writing for 15 minutes at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, so make sure you ask any questions you might have in the Zoom chat or in the Facebook comments. Uh, without further ado, let's move over to you, Don. Thanks very much, Sam. It's uh, <laughs> lovely to be here again and to join people all around the world talking about IELTS writing. And as Sam said, this is part of a series, IELTS from start to finish. So today, as I said, it's writing and how it's marked. Now, when we talk about IELTS writing and how it's marked, there are two things that you have to think about. The first thing is, what sort of tasks do we give you in the writing? What do you have to do to show that you are able to write in English? And the second thing is, what are the criteria that we use to assess the writing? Now, some people don't know these assessment criteria and that leads to some problems, but I'm going to explain it to you today and hopefully this will help you. Hopefully this will be practical advice. So we're going to give you some practical advice. And that means advice that you can really use when you do the writing test in IELTS. As I said, we're going to talk about the assessment criteria. That is how you are scored by an examiner. And sometimes, as I said, people forget about those assessment criteria and they make mistakes. I'll point out some of the major mistakes that people make and you can avoid them. Okay, writing. Now writing is difficult. The reason it is difficult is that you are able to make many, many mistakes in writing that you wouldn't make in speaking. When you speak in English, in any language, we're not worried about your spelling. We're not worried about your punctuation. We're not worried about your uh, paragraphing. And in the IELTS test, we're not really even worried about whether you're answering the question directly. But in IELTS writing, we worry about all those things. And that is why IELTS writing is a bit difficult. It must be a bit more difficult. Now you'll see here in this slide that there are two types of IELTS. There is the academic IELTS and the general training IELTS. IELTS is unique because it offers two different types of test. The academic test is used for entry to a university. It's used for gaining registration as a doctor or nurse or accountant in an English speaking country. The general training is often used for vocational courses or to show an employer that you are able to speak English. It's also used for immigration purposes, but so is the academic. If you are doing the test, the paper based test in Australia, you will do the writing first. But if you're doing the test in Bangladesh or in uh, South America or in Europe or somewhere else, the writing will be the last part of the written test. And if you're doing the computer delivered test anywhere in the world, the listening will be the first part of the test. But here, this is the way that the paper based test is constructed in Australia. It doesn't matter in what order those parts of the test come. Here, writing, reading, listening and speaking, they are all the same. It doesn't matter in which order they come. You'll see here that the academic writing is 60 minutes and there are two tasks. 
Now, these two tasks are very different to each other. The first task is asking you to describe in words something that is given to you as a picture, something that is given to you as a graph or maybe as a chart of figures, maybe a table of figures, maybe a diagram. And your task is to describe that graph, those figures, that diagram in words. You only have to describe it. That is task one in the academic test. We're going to look at a good example of that later on. So just wait for that. Task two is the most important part of writing. It's twice the marks of task one. And here you have to give your opinion about something. You are given a statement and then you are asked, do you agree? Or you are asked to discuss this statement. You are asked to give reasons for this. You are asked to present solutions. We will look at some good examples later on. The general training also has two tasks and you have 60 minutes to do them. But the first task is very different. It is writing a letter. Now, some people think, well, this is an easier task, but it's not. It's an easier task for some people, but maybe it's a more difficult task for other people. Maybe. You are good at describing a graph and not so good at writing a letter. So don't assume that the general training is an easier test. It's simply a different test. And the purpose of the general training is to see if you can operate in an English speaking workplace, if you are able to use English in a social situation rather than at a university. So the task one is writing a letter and we will look at a good example of that later. And task two is like the academic task two. It is giving your opinion about a topic. Now, if you are reading in English, if you are reading newspapers in English or magazines in English, Look at opinion pieces. Look at a columnist who wants to give his or her opinion about a topic. That is a good example of a task to essay. So read, that's an important tip. Okay, as I said before, we are going to talk about the tasks, but we're also going to talk about the assessment criteria. And in writing, there are four assessment criteria. The first one is task achievement. What does that mean? Well, task achievement means that you understand the question and you answer that question and not a different question. You answer that actual question directly and clearly. Now that question might be a simple question or it might be quite a difficult, complicated question. Sometimes it's easier than other times. But look at the question very carefully and understand what is required by you to answer the question. That is the first criterion. The second criterion is coherence and cohesion. Now, coherence really means that what you write is logical. It means that people can understand it. It means that you begin with an introduction that tells the reader what you're going to do. Then you proceed to talk about one thing, which leads on to another thing. And finally, you conclude with some sort of general statement. 
This is coherence. It's about using paragraphs logically, maybe four, maybe five paragraphs. The cohesion is about linking your ideas together. And the words we use to link those ideas are important. The examiner is looking for linking words. Now we can all write an essay saying first, blah, 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 second, blah, 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 third, blah, blah, blah. These are very simple linking words. But the more sophisticated, the more clever your linking words, the higher your score will be for this criterion. Okay, the third criterion is lexical resource. It means what words do you use? And in writing, the most important thing is your spelling. Can you spell these words correctly? If you can't spell very well, you won't get more than a band five for this criterion. If you can spell okay, and if you have a range of words, and if you use these words naturally, then you will get a high score for this criterion. And remember what I said about reading. Using natural English words is something that you will learn the more that you read. Okay. And finally, the last criterion that the examiner looks at, and they will give you a score for each of these four criteria, and each of these four criteria are one quarter of your mark. The last criterion is grammar. Now, it's not just grammatical accuracy, it's grammatical range as well. This means that you can write a short sentence. And you can also write a longer sentence. All of your sentences don't have to be long. Good English writing is a combination of short sentences and longer sentences. The important thing for you is to write sentences that you are confident are accurate and correct and also to spend a bit of time at the end of your writing checking that they are accurate. You may have a problem with tenses in English. It's difficult. Past tense, future tense, present perfect tense, continuous. You may have a problem with prepositions, in, on, with, by, for, after. You may have a problem with a and the. Focus on these problems and improve those things and you will improve your score for grammatical range and accuracy. I hope that you have downloaded or accessed the public version of the assessment criteria and you'll find that on IELTS.com. If you haven't, have a look at it now if you can or after this presentation, and you'll see these four criteria and what you can do at a band five, at a band six, at a band seven, at a band eight, and band nine. Let me explain grammatical range a bit more. Grammatical range. Now, these four sentences were probably written by somebody who was answering a question about education. What is the value of a good teacher? How does a teacher influence a student? And this person writes, I liked my high school. My teachers were good. My best subject was science. I became a scientist. Every one of these sentences is perfect English. If you look at the assessment criteria, writing all of your essay with these simple sentences 
will not get you more than a band six. We need to show the examiner that we can also make longer sentences. Look at this. Now, instead of four simple sentences, we have two complex sentences. I liked my high school because my teachers were good. My best subject was science, which is why I became a scientist. Here, you have given the examiner a reason to give you a band nine because you have shown that you can construct complex sentences accurately. So think about that. Think about different complex sentences that you can use in your writing. And again, you will find these when you read. Let's look at academic writing task one. Now, as I said, academic task one writing is taking visual information, a graph, a table, a diagram, and describing it in words. You have to summarize the main information and you should write 150 words. Remember, task one is half the mark of task two. In other words, one third of the whole writing mark. So don't spend 30 minutes on this, spend 20 minutes, spend one third of your time on task one. Here is a very good example of an IELTS academic task one task. You are always told what you are looking at. And here it says, the charts show the number of Japanese tourists traveling abroad between 1985 and 1995 and Australia's share of the Japanese tourist market. They are telling you what it's about. So read that very carefully. Understand what you are looking at. And then always in an academic task one, you are told, summarize the information, select the main features and make comparisons. Those three things are very important. So what are the key features here? What are the main features that we have to describe? Well, I think it's quite clear. The first graph shows that about 5 million uh, Japanese traveled overseas as tourists in 1985 and it steadily rose. In 1995, it was about 15 million. It tripled. There were three times the number in that 11 years. And the second graph shows that 2 million Japanese tourists came to Australia at the beginning of that period. And at the end, it was about 6 million. Again, the number triple but the number who came to Australia was far fewer than went overseas generally they are the main features it's a fairly simple comparison but what else is important here there was a decline of the number of uh, tourists in 91 and there was a decline of, uh, in the number of tourists coming to Australia in 1990. Now that's important. If there was an exception, if there was something different to the general trend, that's important to mention. Apart from that, you have covered the main features. Let's look at a really good essay that answers this question. And the way it answers it, it does three things. The first thing is it writes an introduction that talks about what they are talking about, that mentions where they are talking about, that mentions the dates when 
they are talking about. It highlights the key features and it uses numbers, figures to support that description. And finally, it writes an overview. This is what you must do in an academic task one. Let's look at this example, which is very good. The first paragraph is the introduction, of course. And it uses different words to the words that were given in the task. It doesn't talk about tourists or Japanese traveling overseas. It says Japanese who spent their holidays overseas. It doesn't use the word percentage. It talks about the proportion of them who visited Australia. It is giving the same information that we gave in the task, but expressing it in other words. This tells the examiner that this person has a good lexical resource. Remember the third criterion. Can you use words? Can you use a variety of words? Then this essay goes on in the second paragraph to describe the first graph, talking about the numbers of Japanese tourists traveling abroad. Now here you will see it uses dates, 1985 by 1990, the end of the period, and it uses numbers to support that. 5 million, 11 million, 15 million. What would happen, of course, if they forgot to use those numbers? Now, if you have downloaded the assessment criteria, and if you have them in front of you, then you'll have a look at the task achievement criterion, the first column for task one and look for the word data. Data just simply means numbers, numbers to support your description. Is it a band five that you would get if you forgot to use numbers? Is it a band six, a band seven, a band eight? Have a look at that. We'll come back to the answer in a minute. The next paragraph deals with the second graph and it does the same as the first paragraph, as, as the other paragraph. It uses numbers, it uses dates, and it describes very successfully the main features. It doesn't talk about every date. It doesn't say in 1985, in 1986, in 1987, in 1988, in 1989. No, it chooses the most important date. And that's enough. Looking at the main features, not every feature. Now, you may have looked at your assessment criteria. What happens if we don't use figures? Well, the answer is this. The examiner must give you only a maximum of five for the first criteria. And believe me, some test takers forget to use numbers when describing a graph. And this is a problem. It's a big penalty. They may get eight for coherence and cohesion, eight for lexical resource, eight for grammatical range and accuracy, but they forgot numbers. So they get a five for the first criterion. Don't do that. Okay. The final part of this essay is an overview. An overview is one or two sentences that summarize the main points. What happens if you forget the overview? Look at your assessment criteria. Is it a band five, a six, seven, eight? We'll come back to that. Here, the overview is very good. It's one long sentence, but it could be two sentences. 
This person says overall, which is a good start because it tells the reader, here is the summary. You might use the word summary in summary, or you might say to sum up. Despite the relatively small proportion of Japanese tourists coming to Australia, the increase in the country's share of the Japanese tourist market corresponded closely with the growth in Japanese tourism overseas generally. You could say full stop and then make us another sentence. It trebled in the 10 year period. If you forget that overview, then you will only get a band five for the first criterion. So make sure you do summarize the main features in one paragraph, usually the final paragraph. Okay, we've looked at the uh, academic task one and just to remind you of the main points, 150 words, not 250 words, not 130 words, 150 to 170 is a good number. Have you included an overview? Have you selected not all features, but the most important features? Have you used numbers to support the description? Have you compared? In this case, compared the graphs with each other, compared the years with each other. Have you used linking words to connect your ideas? Have you organized your essay into paragraphs? In the essay we just saw, there were four paragraphs. That's a good number for a task one. For a task two, it might be four or five paragraphs. Have you checked at the end for mistakes in grammar and spelling? This is important. Commonly, people will forget to use figures. Sometimes they will try to explain the information. They may say that in 1990, fewer people came to Australia from Japan because the weather was bad. That's not a good answer. There is no information about the weather. Don't do that. Sometimes they will say in 1985, this happened, in 1986, this happened, in 1987, this happened. Don't do that. Choose the main features. And sometimes people forget the overview. It could be at the beginning. It could be in the middle, but probably it would be at the end of your essay. And finally, sometimes your task is not a graph. It is a diagram that describes a process. It might be something like how to make something or how to achieve something or how to construct something. If you have a task like this, then your overview is saying there are four or five stages in this process. And they involve this, this, and this. There are good examples of this on the um, IELTS.com website. So go there and have a look at those things. Okay. We're going to look at general training because I know a lot of you are very interested in the general training task one. It's often used for immigration. It's, as I said, it's not necessarily easier for everybody, but for some people, it is an easier task, writing a letter. Here is an example of a formal letter, a task where we have to write to somebody we do not know. That is a formal letter. We are not writing to a friend. We are writing to someone we do not know. And so we must be respectful. We must use more formal language. I'll talk about that in a minute. In a general training task one, you are always told 
what the situation is. And here, the situation is this. There have been some problems with public transport in your area recently. And then you are told who you are writing to. In this case, write a letter to the manager of the public transport company. You don't know this person. It's a formal letter. And finally, you are told to cover three or maybe even four points. And here, the points are one, describe the problems. Two, explain how these problems are affecting the public. And three, suggest what changes could be made. We will always tell you how to begin your, your letter. Here, we tell you, begin with dear sir or madam. This is the beginning of a formal letter. Let's look at how one person has written this letter. And this person has done three important things. Firstly, they have stated the purpose of the letter at the beginning. Secondly, they have covered all of the bullet points, those three bullet points, fully. And finally, they have maintained an appropriate tone throughout. I will explain tone more in a moment. But if you do these three things, you will get a good score for your task achievement. And that is the thing that we are really focusing on here. Now, this person writes their letter and very importantly, they are able to cover all of the bullet points. Now, what would happen if they forgot one of those points? Remember the points? What are the problems with public transport? What is the effect of these problems? What are the solutions? Maybe they forgot to talk about the effect of these problems. That would be a big mistake. We'll come back to that in a minute. Is it a band four that they would get? A five, a six, or a seven for the first criteria? This person, of course, begins the letter by stating the purpose of the letter. This is what you must do. Why are they writing? Answer, I write to draw your attention to recent problems, plural, with public transport in Newtown, briefly. The roadworks have led to long delays. Furthermore, the bus timetable has reduced the frequency of buses. Two problems are mentioned. Why two? Because the task asks for problems, not one problem, problems. So be careful. Is the task asking for you to describe one problem or two problems? One solution or two solutions? One event or two events? Be careful about that. This person continues. And in the second paragraph says, the effect of these actions is uh, numerous, that there are uh, high uh, levels of public concern about the uh, delays, 20 minutes more or more to travel the length of the road, and that the people are not going shopping on Saturday mornings, so the retail business, the shops are losing money. Two problems, two effects. And then they continue and they offer a solution. May I suggest rerouting the buses? May I suggest changing the timetable? This person has fully answered the question. And if they had not, then they would have only got a band four. A band four for that first criterion, task achievement, means 
that you have not answered each of those points fully. So remember that. This person has maintained the proper tone. Now, what does that mean? They have said, I write to draw your attention to. This is a very formal way of saying, I want you to know about the problems. If I was writing to my friend, I'd say, listen, there are lots of problems. But you are writing to someone who is not your friend. So you have to use a formal tone. They use words like furthermore. If you're writing to your friend, you'd simply say, and as well. They say there is a high level of public concern about. If you're writing to your friend, you'd say, well, everyone's worried about this. May I suggest is a formal way of is expressing what you would say to your friend, I want you to do something. I would also recommend to your friend, you would say, can you do this? This letter finishes yours faithfully. If you're writing to your friend, you'd say yours or with love or regards. This is important because this is one of the assessment criteria. If you don't maintain the correct tone in your letter, you will only get a band five for the first criteria, task achievement. The tone may be variable and may be inappropriate. Okay, my advice to you about general training task one is simple. Understand the situation. Maybe there is one, more than one point that you have to cover. Sometimes it will talk about problems. So make sure there is more than one problem. Sometimes it will talk about solutions. Make sure there is more than one solution. Make sure that you make the purpose of your letter clear from the beginning. Make sure that you use paragraphs because letters need paragraphs too. Finish the letter politely and maybe looking towards the future. I look forward to your answer, for example. Make sure that your style is suitable. That means tone, formal or informal. Make sure that you change the words a little bit that you are given. Make sure that you start the letter in the way that we suggest. You don't need to write your address at the top. That would be a waste of time. And finish the letter in an appropriate way. Okay, now we're gonna look briefly at task two. And academic and general training task two, as I said, are quite similar. It means giving an opinion about a statement. And this is important. There are different types of tasks in task two, and you have to be aware of what they are. You may be simply asked for your opinion. Do you agree? You may be asked to discuss more than one opinion. You may be asked to, to give reasons and to give solutions, for example. You may be asked to give uh, uh, causes and effects and then give an opinion about how uh, the, those effects could be solved. All of these things are different tasks. And this means that you need to read the question very carefully. Let's look at some examples of this. We're going to look at four different essays and these essay tasks are all on the same topic. They're all about the popularity of shopping as a leisure activity. Now remember, a task two is 40 minutes. It's twice the value of a task one. It's longer, it's 250 words. About 260 or 270 is good, but don't write 350. 
That's too many words. Now, this first task is, is a simple one. You are given a statement. Some people believe the increasing popularity of shopping as a leisure activity is positive. Do you agree? It's a simple question. You can answer this easily. Yes, I agree. Or no, I disagree. For these reasons, that would be a perfectly good answer for this task. But let's look at another task. It's the same topic. Some people believe the increasing popularity of shopping as a leisure activity is a positive trend. Others believe it is harmful to individuals. And then you are asked to discuss both views and give your own opinion. You are asked to do three things now, not one thing. If you don't do three things, you will be penalised. So be careful. You must spend a paragraph discussing one view, another paragraph discussing the other view, and another paragraph probably giving your opinion. This essay is probably about four paragraphs or five, if you include a conclusion. Let's look at another example. Again, it's the same topic. Shopping is becoming more and more popular as a leisure activity. However, some people feel that this has both positive and negative effects. Now, you are asked to give a reason for why shopping is popular. And then you are asked to say what the effects have, not just on you, the individual, but also on society. Now here you have to do three things. You have to say why it is popular, what is the effect on individuals like yourself, and what is the effect generally on a society? This is a very different question to the first question. It's the same topic, but it's a different task. This is important. If you wrote an essay like you would in the first, to what extent do you agree? For this task, you would get a low score for task response, the first criterion. Finally, let's look at another example, the same topic, but a different task. There are problems with the increasing popularity of shopping as a leisure activity. What are the problems? Do the problems outweigh the benefits of shopping as a leisure activity? Here, you have to make a judgment. You have to evaluate the positives and the negatives and then say, which is more important? You can see here with these four examples that what we are looking at is not one essay about shopping, we are looking at four very different essays about shopping. And you must be very careful that you read the task to task carefully so that you can answer relevantly. My advice to you is this, spend more time on task two because it is more important. Make sure that you express an opinion because this is in a part of the assessment criteria. Use paragraphs, and each paragraph will have one central idea in it, which you will explain and support. Make sure that you use a range of vocabulary and grammar. Simple words, more unusual words. Simple sentences and longer sentences. Make sure that you understand what you are being asked. What is the task? Make sure that you use a variety of linking words, not just first, second, third, but given that this is so, if, then. Focus on those parts that link 
ideas when you read. When you read, make a note of some of the linking words. Make sure you write in full sentences and full paragraphs. Don't use dot points. Don't use subheadings. Don't use numbered lists. Make sure you spend a little time checking your work at the end. To summarize everything we've been talking about, and it's a lot, make sure that you are focusing on your writing, even when you read. Make sure that you are focusing on your speaking when you write. Try and bring this all together so that you are learning all of your skills all of the time and do it regularly when learning a language. Set a target. How many words am I going to learn today? How long am I going to read for today? How long am I going to speak in English for today? Do you want to do the academic? Do you want to do the general training? Do you have a choice? Ask the university. Ask the government department. Ask the professional organisation and find out. Look at the assessment criteria that we've been talking about and know how you will be scored. You will find that some of what you are doing is good, but some of it maybe can be improved. Do an IELTS preparation course. It's a good idea. But as with everything, the main game is outside the classroom when you go shopping when you're waiting at the bus stop, when you're talking to your friends, when you're lying in bed with a book, you're learning. Okay, to finish up, we have a global community in IELTS and you can access it from wherever you are. Go to our website. I've talked about it before, ielts.idp.com. You can go to our Facebook page, we will answer questions if you want to put some there and you can read the answers to many other questions. You can go to TikTok. You can go to various uh, YouTube uh, videos that we have uh, as well on the internet. And there should be something there that will help you. If there isn't, go to our Facebook page and ask a question. Remember that this is a series and this uh, session that we've just had is about writing but if you are particularly interested in speaking and how it's marked on the 22nd of April we will have another session with the fabulous Tina Hartman who knows everything about speaking. Okay I'm ready to answer some questions and Sam might pop in pop his beautiful head in and be the moderator here. That sounds, like, that sounds like a great plan, Don. Uh, thank you for that incredibly insightful webinar. I think we all learned a little something about the written word. Uh, and you always want it pretty well to time, which is great for the question and answer session. Uh, we've had a lot of questions come in. Are you ready to kick off? Yeah, I'm ready. Cool. All right, question one, uh, how much time should I spend studying for IELTS if my level is pre-intermediate? Well, a pre-intermediate is what we would call someone who is maybe at a band five. And um, it depends really what your goal is. Someone who is at a band five might want to get a band six. They might want to get a band seven, a band eight or a nine. Usually it takes at least three months to move half a band. So realistically, if you're a band five and you want to be a band 5.5, you're looking at about three months. If you want to get up to a six, you might be looking at six months or more. But there are so many variables. Are you young? Are you, uh, are you very good at your first language? Do you have a lot of time to study? Are you able to speak English at home? All of these things will affect how quickly you can progress. Excellent answer. Thank you, Don. Uh, that's some great knowledge you've imparted. Uh, question two, does the examiner count the number of complex sentences, topic specific words and connectors while marking the task? No, they don't count. 
they don't say oh yes there are 10 complex sentences um, that's not the way that they mark but they do want to see evidence of complex sentences and a variety of them but not all sentences have to be complex a good writer in any language will write a mixture of simple and complex sentences the if you are repeating the same marker for example if you're just saying and 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 or so 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 this will be very obvious to the examiner so the examiner will read for all of those four criteria and will make a judgment for each of those criteria and the judgment may be quite different it might be a five for the task achievement it might be a seven for the lexi um, coherence and cohesion because your paragraphing is very good and you're using good uh, connecting words your spelling may may not be so good so it might be a six for lexical resource your grammar might be a six as well so that's the way the examiner looks at your essay and by the way there are two examiners who look at your essay one examiner looks at the task one and the other examiner looks at task two and they don't know each other they don't know what the other other person has scored and they don't know anything about you as a test taker okay that's a good amount of examiners i think yes uh, that's right there are lots of them <laughs> that's excellent uh question three in an IELTS writing task to opinion discussion, do I have to write my opinion in the introduction and also in the body of the essay? Um, I would say generally, yes. It's a good idea to express your opinion at the start. I know that in some cultures, in some academic traditions, which are not Western, it's not always the case that you express your opinion at the outset. But in a normal, uh, English uh, essay, uh, the reader expects to know what the writer, what the writer's opinion is. So I would recommend do it at the outset. And again, you would reiterate it. That means uh, reinforce it and repeat it throughout the essay as well. And finally, in the conclusion, you would again summarize the main points and your own position. That was a really thorough answer. Thank you. Uh, question four, can you give us a brief description of each type of essay that can be used for task two academic writing? This might be a lengthy one. Well, that's right. Uh, uh, let me say that the, uh, the item writers, the people who write the tasks for um, IELTS writing, they're not just in England, they're not just in Australia, they are in the United States and in New Zealand and in other places as well. They are always trying to think of variations, new ways of asking a question. And it's not to trick people, but it is simply to remind people that they need to read the question carefully. So I can't give you a full list of all the different types of question but the four that we looked at in that presentation cover probably cover about 70 or 80 percent of the types of question that you might be asked okay excellent uh question five how can i work to improve my coherence and cohesion um well as i said before coherence and cohesion are about being logical, about connecting your ideas with connecting words. So I would say that one very important element is planning your essay. If you can spend two or three minutes at the beginning of your essay saying, okay, I want to make this point. I want to make that point. Here is some evidence for this. I want to make that point. And I want to make this point. Here is an example. That plan there will tell you, well, that's about four paragraphs. That will tell you, well, I'll put this point before that other point because that's more logical. If you can practice planning an essay, then I think that will help you become more coherent. 
And the second part of it, the cohesion, keep gathering new ways of connecting ideas. And this could be grammatical. It could be using an if sentence, for example. That's a good way of connecting ideas. If the government did this, then something else would happen. Now, that is a perfectly coherent and cohesive sentence. So think about all of those ideas, planning and gathering new cohesive devices when you read. I think that was the perfect answer. Thank you, Don. Uh, question six, uh, can we use pronouns in writing task one and two, for example, as we can see or we can clearly see, et cetera? Um, well, uh, they're not, uh, well, the we is a pronoun, that's true. <clears throat> you can use those, um, there's no problem with that. Um, <clears throat> you can use the pronoun I, I believe, I think, in my opinion, that's fine. Um, because the IELTS essay, task two essay, is not really the sort of essay you would write for an academic paper. When you're writing a paper for a university lecturer, you would probably <clears throat> not be personalizing it. You would probably be um, mentioning authorities uh, and using a rather a, a different tone. But don't worry about that. With an IELTS essay, you can use the word I, I think, in my opinion. Um, uh, that's okay because we, you are told, in fact, to do it. They say, use evidence from your own experience and knowledge. And that means you can use the word I, okay? That was great. Thank you, Don. Uh, here's a question I've never seen before. Uh, are examiners allowed to use tools such as Grammarly while checking the computer delivered IELTS writing? <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> um, they shouldn't. Look, the examiners um, don't need to because every examiner has a first degree, at least one, probably a second or third degree. They are experienced teachers of English language. Uh, they have a minimum of three years teaching experience. They uh, most probably have at least 10 years in many cases. They have probably spoken more than one language. They uh, are experts in language. And so they really don't need Grammarly, okay? And if they do, well, they can't use it anyway. <laughs> Examiners sound like they're pretty smart. Well, speaking personally, yes, I think that's true. Uh, this is our last question for the night. This person yes. says, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to ask a question. Uh, would you please tell me how many paragraphs are required for IELTS writing task two? Um, well, there is no rule. Uh, it may depend on the question. If the question is a simple one, statement, to what extent do you agree? You might be able to write three paragraphs, an introduction, a larger paragraph explaining why you agree with a particular thing and then concluding. If it's a different sort of question, discuss both views and give your own opinion, you might be looking at five paragraphs there because you might have an introduction, discussion of one view, discussion of the next view, your own opinion, and then a conclusion. Uh, three to five paragraphs is fine. Six paragraphs, seven paragraphs is probably too many because a couple of those paragraphs could probably be uh, made into one paragraph. So focus on that. Three to five, I would say, is good, a good advice. Excellent. I think that was a great answer to cap off the night. Uh, sadly, that's all the questions we have time for tonight. Uh, remember, if your question didn't get answered, you can just message them to us directly on Facebook and we'll get back to you with an answer. Uh, thank you for joining us and an even bigger thank you to Don Oliver for running through, I think, a spectacular IELTS writing masterclass with some spectacular answers to finish that off. And thank you, Sam, too. Oh, please. Thank you. <laughs> I, I did okay. Um, we'll be back in two weeks with Tina Hartnett, as Don said, the fabulous Tina Hartnett, uh, hosting a speaking masterclass. So we'll see you next time. Uh, great to see you all. Great to see you, Don. Okay, bye-bye. Goodbye, all.